modem to put in my projects. And so I've learned a bunch uh, over the years, and I thought I'd put that together in a slide deck uh, and share it with you. Um, and uh, yeah, so maybe your next projects or products, uh, you can use that knowledge to decide the right solution for you. So a little about me. Hi, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm a product manager at WeWork, um, formerly uh, Particle and Nest, where I, where I learned all this stuff. Um, I won't be talking about either one, uh, Particle, WeWork, or, uh, or Nest. Um, but if you're interested, you can talk to me about them after. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at BerryBerryKicks, um, for those who uh, love cereal. Um, and this talk is uh, on that bit.ly link. So if you want to follow along or just grab it later, feel free. All right, cool. Let's go over the lightweight agenda. Um, so in picking your, your, your modem, there's sort of three main things. Asking the right questions, um, the three amigos of IoT, and I'll talk more about that uh, and uh, why that is, and then uh, maybe some suggestions about picking a modem. Um, I'll try to be as agnostic as possible. Cool. Sounds good? All right, some head nods. All right, uh, so asking the right questions. Um, when I was starting out and as I started working with customers, uh, it, I saw this pattern of key things you need to consider when choosing a modem. Because there is no silver bu bullet for IoT, for connecting your product. Um, but there are some really good parameters or constraints to consider that help you um, down select. Um, so with the buildup, um, time and budget are one of those first order things like any engineering project, uh, time to market. Uh, how much time you as an individual have or your company has, uh, which is very coupled to budget. So for example, if you're going to do a chip-up design versus a module or an off-the-shelf solution, um, that will uh, that'll come into play. If you're building it for yourself or for your house, um, that's a different level of budget versus mass production in 10,000 or, or more MOQs. Basic stuff. Um, the next one, which comes a lot to play with uh, um, cellular devices and um, other types of long range, um, where in the world will it operate? Uh, for example, if you have a cellular based product and there's a cel cellular technology deployed in the area that you're interested in, great. You know, you can use CAT M1 in the US, um, but you can't use that in other parts of the world. Uh, or if you're building a product that has um, different frequencies that are uh, managed or um, sort of laws around them. You might have to have different SKUs for different sub gigahertz frequencies, as another example. So if it's just in the US and you're a US-based company, cool, no worries. Um, but if you start thinking about international or, or if you're outside the US, um, where in the world is actually a pretty important question. Uh, is this a new project? or you're integrating it into something that already exists. So for example, if you, the world's your oyster, you can design it with whatever technology you want and whatever form factor you want, that's pretty open. Um, but if you need to integrate with uh, an existing industrial controller or a consumer end product that you're going to bootstrap with um, internet connectivity, that changes how you think about, about the, uh, your modem. Uh, this is another one that comes up uh, quite a bit. Um, just like you may have not thought about where in the world it operates, um, will it move? Um, or is it a, is a portable device? Uh, certainly having battery powered is a common use case for connectivity, but it's not the only use case. Um, but uh, you know, if, if it's a, a, a scooter type device, it might be different than a robot in a factory, um, a wearable, um, all those uh, change on how you, you know, what you pick. Um, the size of the device means the size of the battery, or the type of radio you can fit in there, or what you're talking to um, will, will vary. Cool. Is this a single point solution? Like you want to connect one thing to one thing, or many things to many things? Uh, that often translates to a large scale network, or a mesh network, um, versus a Bluetooth talk, a device talking to a phone, or a sensor talking to an actuator. Um, those will change the parameters of what kind of radio you're using, maybe what kind of protocol is on top of it. Um, and uh, there's, there's quite a few options uh, along those axes. Uh, does it need to talk to the cloud? Uh, and we'll talk about what, what the I means in a second. But many devices don't need to be an internet of things. It just needs to have some form of connectivity, maybe to a local network um, or you know, an M to M type application where, sure, you need to have a modem. It needs to uh, shuffle data around, but doesn't actually need to talk to a server uh, um, um, remotely. Um, that changes what you can or cannot use. Uh, and along the same axes, is your thing just a thing or is it an internet of thing? 
Um, are you, you, do you want to put Bluetooth connectivity because it's easy to set up? Cool. Um, but do you really need to have that Wi-Fi modem which is going to drain a bunch of power? Um, is it, can it just be an offline device um, or a simple embedded device? Uh, we'll think about that one throughout the course of the talk. So uh, a little bit about the Internet of Things. I, I, I kind of don't like that term anymore, um, even though I, I work in that space. Um, but when we say Internet of Things, we actually are referring to the Internet, right? The I in IoT is the Internet. Um, and from a technology perspective, that typically means we talk about the Internet Protocol. And this is uh, on my right, over my right, uh, yeah, your right, um, is the typical diagram of the o OSI model. Um, and IP lives in layer three, right? So the device is going to speak IP packets over a network, um, and it's going to talk to another device uh, using that same communication primitive. Um, layers above it might be different. Maybe you were using HTTP, like traditional web applications, or co-op, or MQTT. Um, but the fundamental networking protocol is internet. Um, but it could also mean a whole bunch of other things. So this space is com um, convoluted. Uh, a point-to-point -point solution, like a Bluetooth device talking to a Bluetooth um, on your phone, that's sometimes called an IoT device, but it's really just a Bluetooth link. Uh, and it's point-to-point, -point and it's, there's no internet involved at all. Uh, maybe the phone is acting as a gateway and sending some information back, but um, that might not categorize as an IoT device. Um, things that are not IP at all. So if you're familiar with LoRa and LoRaWAN, those are non-IP protocols. Uh, they eventually talk to a gateway, which then eventually talks over the internet, over HTTP, which is uh, IP-like. Um, but that's not an internet thing, um, but it's still a connected thing. Uh, simple wireless. Uh, I, I, if you know this uh, NRF24, which is a really old part, it's just your standard 2.4 gigahertz GFSK kind of radio. It's used sometimes in point-to-point, -point, sometimes in mesh, but um, there's no internet involved. They, there's no st stacks even to do IP uh, communication, um, but it's a valid uh, wireless connectivity device. Um, IRDA, anybody ever worked with IRDA or infrared? Yeah, that's, that's found in a bunch of uh, random IPs, your, your, uh, microcontrollers, that uh, is really useful, especially for FCC, and it's just as useful as, as audio. Um, I worked on a 20% project many moons ago using sound as a digital communication medium. Um, and it, pro tip, if you want to ship internationally, you don't have those regulations with 800, 400, 900, because it's just sound. Um, and it can do a decent uh, band rate. Um, if you're actually interested in that, not to belabor the point, there's a cool startup called Chirp that makes that really easy to use and integrate into your products. Um, and everybody talks about wireless, but there's also wired. Uh, connected devices can have wires. We think about Ethernet. Ethernet is rock solid. Um, PoE is actually pretty easy to integrate these days. Um, and you see other forms of IP-based uh, networking um, in industrial automation like Ethernet, which is Ethernet over CAN. Um, or EtherCAN is Ethernet over CAN, uh, or USB, um, there's IP over USB and a bunch of other wireless protocols that still makes your product connected, but not necessarily uh, internet connected directly. Um, and all these are valid solutions, um, and oftentimes you might have multiple forms of connectivity in your, in your connected product. So keep that in mind. Any, any questions? Everybody seems to be nodding along like, oh yeah, this is cool stuff, we know this stuff. All right, it's more about framing how you think about uh, um, connectivity. That's at least my, was my hope. Um, the other aspect, and sorry, I added a slide on the way here, uh, is we al often talked about, um, we think about IoT products as constrained or low power uh, products. Um, so that means they're battery power devices because they're oftentimes portable or in places that we can't get access to uh, line current. Um, and they should last for months or years. Um, and the nice thing about that, uh, sort of the, the side effect of that is uh, they don't have a lot of juice to do other things. So it typically means lower bandwidth or, or lower data rate, um, which is great because a lot of IoT products are just simple sensor or lightweight actuation. So we can make that trade off for less bandwidth and lower power. And uh, oftentimes it's a consumer grade product or consumer like product where cost really matters. So you want to get that thing as small and as cheap as possible. So that means usually less capable. So. Um, that's not always the case, and yeah, you can argue a self-driving car is an IoT product because it has a modem and it talks to the internet, um, but it doesn't look like this. So there's, there's definitely exceptions to this sort of common rule. And now the, the three amigos. Uh, I actually coined this phrase with David Schultema in the back. Um, and it's actually a fundamental way of thinking about uh, com radio communication and how you pick your modem because there's these three primitives that are interrelated, power, range, and bandwidth. We're going to spend some time 
try to really digging in uh, into the Three Amigos. Um, by the way, it's a great film, a classic. <laughs> it's not about IIT, but these slides are. Um, so talk about power. Um, usually you look at the total maximum current of a particular modem. Um, the, the reason why you look at maximum is because there'll be a huge variability b uh, around power consumption, uh, depending on the way the protocol that's running on top of the device uses the radio and the way your application uses the radio. For example, if it updates once a minute versus once a month, um, it's going to change your power consumption profile. But that baseline max current of the particular radio is a good um, selection pro uh, filter. Uh, and similarly, range also has a spectrum. Um, some radio technologies are in the centimeters or sub-centimeters, all the way up to the tens to hundreds of kilometers. Um, so that the, the range will that of your product uh, and communication between devices will depend, uh, will, will change which, which technology you want to use. Um, but also range can translate to things like uh, coexistence or uh, reliability in a very noisy environment. Um, so things that have longer range can actually perform better in those noisy environments. Or penetration, so a thing that's on the base, uh, base floor of a building wants to talk to a sensor f uh, six floors down, going through all that concrete um, also uh, sort of maps to sort of the range uh, um, capabilities. And the last, the last one is bandwidth. This is one that I actually um, I, I find people oftentimes are surprised at the bandwidth available to these low power constrained devices. Um, sometimes they're bytes per message or bits per message. Uh, and even the protocols that run on top of these um, certain devices can regulate how often you can communicate. So your effective throughput um, or data rate is significantly lower depending on which radio you choose. Um, for example, you know, Wi-Fi, it's basically wireless LAN. You can stream video. LoRa, 51 bytes per message on LoRaWAN. Um, and you, in some classes, you can only update uh, once an hour. So. These trade-offs are important because you might be limited to do certain things. And so uh, the relationship is, is kind of like you're, everyone's nods their head, yeah, I get this. I, I understand how this works from practical sense. But the relationship is really hard to visualize. Um, I've actually found the best visual visualization is uh, from McKinsey, of all places. They have this really detailed uh, survey on connectivity and IoT radios. Um, and I just record myself looking at it. And you can kind of see uh, on this uh, three-axis graph, there's data rate, there's range, uh, and there's power consumption. So some of these are generally relative values. And as I'm toggling through the, the technology, you can see the differences in radio technology and what they excel at. Um, some of them have a very uh, wide range uh, of range, um, but they don't, they don't have um, flexibility in sort of bandwidth or throughput. Um, similarly, some of them have a really uh, huge uh, variability in, in data rate, um, but can't really do long range. So uh, let's see what right here, like Bluetooth, right? That will never be useful for a long range application, um, but can be uh, toggled from high power mode because it's doing an OTA and then drop it down to normal operations. So these sort of trade offs between radios are really important to get intuition about. Um, <coughs> But this is a McKinsey article, an interactive infographic. Um, you can read more if you go to the link. Um, but it's not very scientific. And I struggle to find scientific measurements that compare different technologies like this. Um, oops, not, that's not the right slide. Um, some vendors will do a technical comparison um, in a lab setting. Um, this is actually from Silicon Labs. They're a good source because they have IP and um, uh, sort of custom silicon in uh, multiple radio technologies. So they're comparing their own um, uh, hardware. Uh, but if you want to get that full spectrum of, should I use uh, 2G or Bluetooth, you're going to kind of have to build that yourself um, if you really need to, to sort of dial in different vendors. Um, but the setup they have here is super impressive. It's a nice white paper to dive in. It's everything from the bandwidth, the power, um, the point-to-point -point, uh, capabilities, but also even mesh networking. Um, so this is a, this is a good read. Uh, and they even show pictures of their lab setup. You can totally do this yourself. Um, you know, oscilloscopes uh, and custom software are pretty portable, um, and you can do it pretty crudely to get that measurement um, if if you just want to get a sense. Uh, and now I want to break down those axes uh, one by one. Um, this is a graph I've I've made too many times because I keep on losing the original slides, uh, but it shows you this non-scientific relative range um, based off the technology. And I'm going to go through them one by one and, and talk about uh, wh what they are and why they excel, um, and maybe some, some uh, additional information that will be helpful later. 
Um, so as you go along the different technologies, they really are effective at different ranges for communication. Um, some of these technologies are used for more than communication, like advertising or um, scanning of cards. Uh, but you might even c couple two of these together. So uh, preamble over. Um, so the far left, NFC and RFID more generally, uh, near field communication um, found in, in your phones, but also in readers and writers. I think there's the proxy folks here. Uh, yeah, there you are. Um, in terms of connectivity, uh, there's a very sl narrow sliver of NFC uh, that is for peer-to-peer -peer communication. That's, um, for example, you have, if you have two Android phones and you tap, tap them together, you can share contact information. That's using the peer-to-peer -peer spec. Um, there's other forms, like you know, more traditional uh, cards, but it's not can't be used for data communication in the same way. Um, that's millimeters to centimeter range, depending on which radio and uh, what's your transmitter and receiver. Um, that's great for setup. Like a lot of times, you see it for setting up devices. As you move up the range stack, uh, there's this call it 2.4 gigahertz type radios, and they're vastly different. Um, you have Bluetooth and 802.15.4 uh, kind of in the tens of meters. Um, for those who are not familiar with 802.15.4, it's what's used by Zigbee and smart meters. Um, and Bluetooth uh, Classic uh, and, and LE is in, in our phones everywhere. Um, they, they're great for sort of your personal area network is what they're typically called within this room or um, for a device that comes into space and moves out of the space, but you don't want to be physically close. Um, Wi-Fi, we all, we're all super familiar with Wi-Fi. Uh, that operates in multiple uh, frequency ranges. Um, but that's where you want to stream data, uh, lots of data, and often. Um, and now we're starting to get the, p the, uh, the point of you know, uh, even making it battery powered is starting to become a real thing, which is cool. Um, but that's in, uh, call it hundreds of meters, uh, in really, really good conditions, depending on your setup. Um, but think of it more about penetration in buildings. Uh, and now we go into the kilometer to tens of kilometers range. Uh, oftentimes it's called sub gigahertz or LP WAN class. That's uh, the industry term for low power, low power again, wide area networks. Um, to show hands, who's familiar with LoRa and LoRaWAN or Sigfox? Yeah, I figured most people. Um, and I throw in Ysun. Uh, Ysun's another standard alliance. Um, it's for a different radio technology, um, an IEEE standard, uh, but similar idea. Um, and then. Working our way up cellular, uh, it's kind of a deceitful to put cellular up here because it's not an actual long range technology. It just so happens that we have tons of towers deployed. Um, but from a product creator's perspective, you can have a product that roams around and has effective range outside of a building. Um, and there's a whole two hour talk I can give on, on cellular and, and I'm not even an expert, uh, just how complicated that space is, but um, we'll touch on it a little bit more. Uh, and sort of, crazy space and, and uh, satellite-based internet. Um, it's a thing. There's people, even hobbyists, who are able to use satellite in their products. And uh, in the next coming years, it'll become more and more accessible as um, new satellite startups are coming in. I'll touch on those. Um, but that's uh, low power global area network. Um, that's what the G stands for. Uh, cool. So we went to talk about range, and we're talking about uh, current consumption. I'm just trying to check how small is that in the back? Uh, <laughs> all right, so I'm going I'm to just kind of highlight a few points. Um, <coughs> in the beginning, I talked about maximum current consumption. <coughs> and for the most part, this is actually one of the things you can find in a data sheet for the different radio vendors' specific information, if you can get a data sheet. Um, they'll usually call it under electrical characteristics. And the thing that I'm focusing here on these slides is uh, the maximum uh, current consumption of the radio. Because um, that's how you get a fairer comparison between vendor A and vendor B. They'll have the total current consumption sometimes, like the MCU, the peripherals at full throttle. Um, but if you can get it just focus on the, that radio, it's, it's pretty helpful. Um, and so you can see on the left is uh, the Nordic uh, NR52. Um, its maximum basically transmit power kind of-ish is about 30 milliamp hours. Uh, on the right, uh, so that's Bluetooth, uh, BLE. Uh, on the right is well, Wi-Fi and the ESP32, um, kind of-ish, maximum uh, uh, at one megabit per second, 240 milliamp hours. So there's already basically an order of magnitude between BLE and, and Wi-Fi. And the bottom is uh, cellular. This is a 2G modem, probably one of the oldest cellular technologies. Probably can't see it down there, but that says 1.9 amps. Um, and that has to do with the spec and the 
transients for boot up and all these other things. Uh, so there's a big difference. Oh. That, that is a great question. Um, it's not just duty cycle, it's the carriers in cellular, for example, carrier restrictions on how often you can chat. Um, yeah, it, 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 it can affect it wildly. The, the challenge here is, though, uh, especially on 2G, which is uh, really old technology at this point, um, carriers require certain capabilities to be on their network. And one of them is to demonstrate your ability to broadcast as loud as possible in order to find the nearest tower in a noisy city. Um, so that's where some of that comes from. Um, but uh, duty cycle, as, as the name implies, you can literally cut the power uh, in half. And most RF communication protocols don't have a 100% duty cycle. They're usually in the 30% on average duty cycle. Um, so these numbers are indicative of worst case uh, or you know, sort of naive implementation, but also do reflect sometimes, for example, if you're streaming um, for an OTA, that's closer to what you're going to see during that period. So it's not just a simple you know, uh, calculation. Um, that's where testing comes into play. But if you want to go see all the data sheets for all these different technologies, it's pretty easy to do. If you want to figure out how to do it in your own application, you're probably going to have to hire someone. Um, true power RF testing needs a really good lab. Um, there's a bunch of them in the Bay Area, even more globally, um, if you're manufacturing in Asia. Uh, um, for example, my former employer had uh, partners there. Because um, you have additional functionality. You have, of course, your microcontroller. Maybe you have additional microcontrollers. But then you have your RF front end, which has a switch. And that might um, use more juice. Uh, so sometimes you might be in the border of your, your power regulator. And you might have to bump it up because of the additional stuff you didn't take into consideration. Um, but that chart, that relative distance chart, I think would make a really good power chart on Hackaday.io. Maybe one day, if I have some time, I'll, I'll, I'll put more scientific data out there. Um, but you can, you can get that sort of feel of the, of the scale. Um, and then there's, there's bandwidth. Uh, I, I talked about how I, I could do another two-hour talk about cellular. But just looking from left to right, these are the different versions of the cellular spec. There's, I didn't know about this before I got into the space, but there's an actual um, alliance that figures this stuff out. Um, on the very left is uh, Cat M1. Um, call that your typical low-end 3G modem. Um, it's not quite right, uh, but uh, the downlink is 10 megabits per second. We fat if swing all the way to the right, uh, and we look at something like NVIOT, which is uh, a new emergent uh, low-power IoT-grade uh, cellular. It's 250 uh, kilobits per second. Um, so a huge variation in terms of the, the throughput. Now, uh, you talk about duty cycles. Um, if you look at the uplink uh, line, there's two, two, two rows. There's a multi-tone and, and the single tone. That is carrier dependent on how they allow you to communicate for an uplink. Um, so uh, on bandwidth, you can think you have time to do an OTA, but you might have to actually build in scheduling mechanisms such that you can uh, upload when they allow you to. And that might be vary between carriers by country. Um, so it adds additional complexity. Um, Oh yeah, and then latency, they, they can throttle the latency of the network and throttle your, your kind of QoS along, along the network. So if you're streaming, this is not a good technology for you. Um, if you need an OTA, it's probably not a good technology for you, um, but it's, it has trade-offs um, and benefits, like it's a little bit cheaper, um, both on the hardware and, and, and cost. And anyway, bandwidth varies, um, even between different versions of Bluetooth, et cetera. So like the chart of range, the incomplete chart of uh, power, there's an equally interesting uh, chart about, about bandwidth. Um, and these are trying to be very uh, subjective, objective, uh, in the sense that um, these are maximum uh, downlinks and uplinks. If you layer on protocols like um, LoRa, which is the Phi, over LoRaWAN, you'll see there's a huge overhead for LoRaWAN. Um, and people have built proprietary uh, protocols on top of LoRa, which have more, um, more bandwidth available to you. So there's the, the trade-offs you have to also consider from the protocol as well as the, the network you're running on. Cellular is hard. Let me just leave it at that. Um, so kind of the, the, the crux, uh, or the sort of litmus of why I just wanted to make this talk, um, just sort of picking a modem. Uh, I, won't, I don't have specific uh, recommendations in these slides, but I will mention a few. Uh, just trying to be unbiased as, as best as possible. And I can tell you after uh, if, if you want recommendations about things I worked with or companies I worked with and what they have chosen. But um, a little bit of 
precursor before we go to specifics. Uh, there's two terms that are important to know. One is WESOC, which is silly, but it's just a, an SOC that has a, wi a, a modem, a wireless modem in particular on it, versus a transceiver. Um, and I didn't know what those were um, a couple years ago, but now I know why they exist and why they're really important. Uh, a WESOC is literally just a microcontroller with a radio. We take that for granted, but um, more traditionally, radio technology start as a transceiver, and the vendors, when they figure out product market fit, will add it to uh, a, micro, a microcontroller. Um, also, for non-microcontroller-based products, like your MPUs and your laptops and your phones, you don't need a microcontroller to manage the networking stack. You actually want that on the, on, on the host processor. Um, so you can use something like a Wi-Fi transceiver to bundle with your laptop so you can save cost on the Wi-Fi transceiver. So there's, there's trade-offs between um, uh, using a, a WESOC and transceiver. The other one is, is sort of the footprint, right? If you have a microcontroller with a Wi-Fi built in, it's going to be smaller than a, an off-the-shelf microcontroller and a transceiver hanging off the side. Um, yeah. Oh, um, one of the benefits of, of using transceivers uh, that I always forget to mention is you can bundle a bunch of different radio technologies in a single product. Um, that might mean you have a host controller and a bunch of radios because you're doing Bluetooth for phone communication and Wi-Fi for backhaul and NFC for setup, um, which is really convenient and flexible. Um, it also means you can add to an existing, uh, let's say, a WESOC that has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but now you want to add Ethernet as a backhaul, you can just get a, a modem and you, you, you slap it on the back. Um, that gives you flexibility. Um, cool. By the way, has anybody ever interfaced with SDIO? Is that yeah, OK, you guys for sure. Uh, didn't know this, but um, SDIO is an interface that was originally designed for uh, SD cards. Um, and it's so you can shuffle a lot of data back and forth. Well, it turns out that uh, a couple years back, people were putting less SD cards, but the uh, IP vendors, the the silicon vendors were selling all that IP in there. So you this fat pipe uh, for data, and it wasn't being used in the way that it was intended. So a lot of the Wi-Fi vendors saw that and, and latched onto it. So a lot of the Wi-Fi modems you get, or the Wi-Fi transceivers you can get, have an SDIO interface, which is really nice, because that means you're not using up other, other interfaces. So pro tip, think of, if, you see, uh, if you're looking at Wi-Fi, um, look for SDIO. Um, and I touched on this a little bit before, but there's this concept of multi-radio. Um, WESOCs, or um, modems with multiple interfaces, uh, or forms of connectivity. And this is more and more common, um, and you can bundle that with a transceiver. So if you want to add connectivity that the particular um, chip you have doesn't have, it's easy to interface. Um, I talked about SDIOs in the previous slide, and that's, that's a warning because you can um, very easily run out of interfaces as you add more and more radios. Um, a lot of these radios require something like a SPI, and your, your host processor might have a SPI, so now you have to bump up to the next larger chip. Um, so there might be, you, might, you might be better off getting a combined part at that point. Um, and uh, combined chips are good at coexistence, um, and if you build your own sort of multi-radio architecture, you have to figure out coexistence, and for those who have haven't had the joy of dealing with coexistence. It's basically two radios in the same frequency band or same channel interfering. We know this as you know the old classic 900 megahertz phone, and you hear somebody else's conversation, or crowded office space with a bunch of Bluetooth keyboards, and your clicks are taking a half second. Um, that's coexistence. Uh, if you have a chip with all the radios in it, they solve coexistence at like the die layer, uh, or if not, the package layer, um, so which is really nice. And as an example of a very popular multi-radio chip, uh, this is the system architecture for the ESP32. Um, and there's, there's two things I highlight. The blue boxes are all the different forms of connectivity just built into the ESP32. Um, we know it's um, Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth is, 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 the hardware is great, software is gonna be great maybe, um, but it also comes with a CAN bus interface, an Ethernet interface, uh, which some people have got working, um, and IR, one of my favorite unsung heroes. Um, but then it also has a bunch of our standard interfaces, so it has the SPI, it has the SDIO, and it has the UART that you might need to hook on other interfaces. Um, I think they thought about putting SDIO not for SD cards, but to actually use the ESP32 as a, as a transceiver-ish type of interface. Um, there's even code for that. Um, so you'll see this uh, quite often in, in many vendors um, across Wi-Fi and, and et cetera. All right, so uh, I, I just need a slide with a list of all the radio technologies, so I just copy and pasted. Apologize for the lack of preparation. Um, but let's walk through uh, these different technologies. Okay. Um, so RFID and NFC more broadly. Um, 
NXP, uh, this is where I start to give some recommendations. NXP is the pioneer in many of the space. Uh, they they create a lot of the original uh, technology behind uh, NFC, and they're one of the pioneers. If you're going to put NFC in your product, I'd probably pick NXP. Um, there's a link in the, in the slide deck. Uh, with they have a really great site talking about the different flavors of NFC and the capabilities, and not just their chip, but the standard, because um, they are uh, one of the, the founding members. Um, You'll find it a bunch just baked in to um, microprocessors um, and uh, you know, these laptop and tablet grade, grade chips. We'll just throw it in there because it's, it's actually pretty inexpensive both from a IP perspective as well as a transistor cost. Um, uh, and uh, even the, the uh, microcontrollers now have it baked in. But just uh, buyer beware, there are flavors of NFC. Um, I talked in the beginning about NFC for peer-to-peer -peer communication. Uh, which is one type, um, but the most common type is, you know, I, I want to activate it from a phone or I want to read a key card. Uh, those implementations, they're called types or, you know, different sectors of the spec, um, are not readily available. Um, so, for example, uh, the Nordic NR52840, which has a type 2 NFC, um, you can use a phone to activate it and read something off that device, um, but you can't uh, transmit uh, and you can't use peer-to-peer. -peer. So, um, it, depending on what you want to use it for, um, will vary. RFID, uh, we use that as a general term. It actually just is now bucketed more for longer range near field communication. So instead of, you know, s few centimeters, it can maybe go to meter. Um, uh, more power hungry. Uh, doesn't have some of the harvesting capabilities of NFC-ish. These are generalizations, by the way. Uh, uh, people will prove me wrong. Um, so we have Bluetooth, and when we talk about connected products these days, we typically mean Bluetooth Low Energy, or BLE. Um, there are different flavors of Bluetooth, especially um, still being used heavily on mobile phones for audio. Um, that's that uh, has a higher power profile, higher data rate, um, but uh, it's meant for you know, a 3,000 milliamp battery on the back. Um, there's a huge slew of Bluetooth vendors, uh, and <coughs> the Sort of the gold standard for BLE in particular is Nordic. Uh, their family of NRF52 uh, chips uh, are great. Their software support is great. I don't work for them. They didn't, haven't sent me any free hardware. Uh, I just always recommend, if you're doing BLE, uh, look at um, Nordic. <coughs> but a whole bunch of other um, WeSocks have Bluetooth built in, different versions of Bluetooth. Um, many of them now have Bluetooth 5, which is the latest incarnation of Bluetooth, which has some new capabilities in range and, and bandwidth, um, as well as 5.1. Um, but there's also a ton of modules, so if time and budget is important to you, uh, you can find uh, a huge array of high-end module vendors um, like Regato and Murata um, to you know, cost-efficient uh, overseas vendors like Raytech and Itotn. Um, super easy to integrate your design. Just drop it in. You don't even have to think about uh, antenna design. Um, and it's thrown in these days in a lot of multi-radio chips, whether they're MPUs or, or, M or MCUs. Um, just because it's super common to have a product that wants to talk to a phone. That's, that's, and that's typically the use case. Uh, unfortunately, because that's the most common use case, a lot of times software support is lacking, and they only have the bare minimum. Um, Nordic has really good SDKs. Uh, Espressif's ESP IDF barely has Bluetooth support. Um, it's they're really driven by the community, so buyer beware. Oh, and MTK is MediaTek. I, I, that's their uh, st sticker price. I, uh, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know that before I was doing this deck. Anybody use a MediaTek part? Any MIPS fans? No? Okay. Um, but a lot of the low-end uh, laptops and tablets coming out of uh, Asia, they're using MediaTek. Uh, pretty good for the price. Um, now, going up that stack, 802.54. Uh, anybody familiar with 802.54 or Zigbee? Um, so uh, a um, little bias here. I, I worked on this in the space for quite a bit. Um, but it's an IEEE standard, which means the phi itself is defined by a standards body, so it's a little bit more open than others. Uh, it's been around for a while, so there's a lot of silicon, just like in Bluetooth. In fact, a lot of the Bluetooth vendors also have chips that are Bluetooth and a 254 so if you want to have options, you do. Um, NXP and Scilabs and TI kind of have been the bulk of the market um, for a long time, but there's all these other vendors. Uh, and it can actually be used for mesh networking, uh, which is a talk I won't give, uh, but uh, I worked in mesh networking in 802.54 for a couple of years. So uh, if you want to talk about mesh networking, uh, I, I, can, I can talk your ear off. Um, and oh, by the way, uh, Wi-Fi mesh is not quite mesh. It's mesh-ish uh, is what we call it. Um, but 
That's a side note. Uh, now, on Wi-Fi, uh, that's super prevalent. We've seen it in hobby projects for years now with, with low-cost espressifs. Um, but for c consumer and industrial-grade products, uh, that hasn't been the case for a very, very long time. And you're only starting to see espressif ESP32s coming their way into products like, like particle and industrial uh, automation stuff. Um, Broadcom and Cypress kind of been the, the gold standard for, for Wi-Fi uh, in consumer grade. Um, TI has been doing it forever. Um, I just thought today, kind of exciting, the first microcontroller that I know of that has five gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi came out from TI this, this month. Um, most of them are using old um, Wi-Fi uh, standards, so 2.4 gigahertz, uh, HT20, et cetera. Um, you can certainly get five gigahertz um, to the cows come home for Transceivers, like our laptops, are all using 5 gigahertz, but in a single um, WeSock, it's, it's pretty rare. And then there are just a bunch of vendors who do, uh, do Wi-Fi. Uh, Intel is in half the laptops on the planet, um, but TI, uh, I know of, uh, I've worked with Qualcomm, and just a bunch of, uh, like MediaTek, and, uh, et cetera, are also available. Those are harder to integrate with, oftentimes. Um, they're usually like in plastics, as opposed to uh, in, in a SOM or uh, in a module. Um, but they're definitely options for designing your product. And if anybody has experience working with the TP-Links and the real techs of the world, I'd, I'd be curious, because I, I never have. Uh, and now to sub-gigahertz. It's, it's, it's kind of confusing that we use the radio uh, frequency to describe this class of products. It's really LP-WAN, but um, it's different than how we talk about everything before this, right? Um, we, uh, there was a lot, a lot of hands around L um, LoRa and LoRaWAN, um, <coughs> but there's other sub-gigahertz or LP-WAN radio technologies that are not um, cellular. So uh, IEEE 802.15.4G, names are hard, it's confusing, but it's a completely different radio technology from Thread and 802.15.4, it's just from the same working group. Um, that's what you see in smart grids. So smart grids deployed globally uh, it uses that radio technology. Um, and then SIGVOX uh, is also an LP-WAN class. Um, in terms of vendors, basically Semtech uh, co-invented um, LoRa, so they own the, the rights to it. They've started to license it to, to a few other vendors. Uh, I think Microchip is now in mass production, um, but really you're either looking at a, a Semtech module, Semtech, sorry, Semtech chip, chip, a Semtech module, or a repackaged Semtech chip in someone else's module, um, which is fine. Uh, in terms of uh, 802.15.4G, uh, that's been around for decades now. Uh, TI is, owns like two-thirds of the market, uh, and they have really good chips uh, in that space, both on the high range uh, and low power. It's the CC1300 if you're interested. Um, Scilabs also has really good uh, low power versions of that. <coughs> and Sigfox, uh, they're more of a carrier than they are uh, uh, like LoRaWAN, um, so they license out uh, their, te their hardware technology to folks like TI, Scilabs, and um, OnSemi. Um, but you have to make sure there's Sigfox in your area if you want to use it. So cellular, this is my two-hour talk condensed into uh, one slide. Um, cellular is a very broad topic. Uh, the majority of the cellular industry has been around cell, um, cell phone and automotive grade cellular connectivity. So the, the hardware has been sold to cell phone makers and car makers. Um, and only in the last couple of years have we actually seen IoT or low power, low cost um, cellular technology coming out. But as we know, Qualcomm owns a large share of the cellular market in general, and they're, they're definitely a key player in the, the IoT class cellular radio technology. Uh, MediaTek also um, has a lot of uh, cellular modems, SimComs, Sequans. Um, well, oh, my note should be higher up. Uh, one thing about cellular is there is no SOC you can buy for cellular. The technology is, is complicated enough. The RF design is uh, very, very challenging. Um, even to integrate a module requires multi-layer boards at the bare minimum. Like uh, I know from the, the boron uh, from Particle, it's like an eight-layer board, I think. Yeah, all right? And that's just to integrate a U-Blox module. So the majority of products you're going to see out there are going to be module-based as opposed to, uh, you, you look confused. Yeah. It's tiny, and it's got a lot of RF on it. Um, but anyway, we can talk about it later. Um, so most of the, m the majority of products you see out there are going to be using either a U-Blocks module, which is the lion's share of um, like development boards, or QuickTel, um, which is, again, just packaging either uh, Qualcomm or MediaTek inside. Uh, 
I have a, I'm a, if you can tell, I'm a fan of the new Nordic uh, cellular uh, modem. Uh, so what's cool about that one, uh, not to plug them even further, is it's actually a SIP. It's a system in package. Uh, so it's not a module. Um, it's an all-in-one uh, board with, uh, sorry, a, a PCB um, that has not only the all the things you need to be cellular, it's smaller. It's about a quarter of the, uh, sorry, 25% smaller than, let's say, the equivalent um, you know, Qualcomm modem. Um, it has uh, GNS inside, so location tracking. It's an awesome part. Can't wait till they uh, get into mass production. Um, if you're looking for things like CAT M1 and NB-IoT, it's a good place to start. Also means the RF design is smaller, and you can definitely not, don't need an eight-layer board. Um, it's something to keep in mind when thinking about a cellular, and I've touched on it briefly, but the standard that's available in the area you're trying to operate matters. Um, for those who are not familiar, 2G and 3G are going away around the world, but at different rates and at different degrees. So some countries like uh, in parts of Africa, they're going to keep 2G around forever for fallback, where other parts of the world, I think Japan has basically deprecated 3G um, or is very close to deprecating it fully. Um, so you can't rely on those radio technologies. And the, the, new, the new hotness, right, whether it's CAT M1 or NB-IoT for, for more low power, or the fabled 5G um, is not really a thing yet, um, only in very um, limited segments. Uh, funny story, we were testing, when I used to be a particle, we were testing CAT M1, um, and one of our engineers was in Chicago, and the other one was in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, and they were, had full rollout of CAT M1 in both uh, places, and they had different drop packet rates because the software wasn't the same version on the two towers. Um, so this stuff is still pretty, pretty raw. Um, but that was a year ago, um, and it's making a lot, tons of headway. And even NBIOT is starting to light up in the US. Um, so we'll see. But just keep that in mind uh, as you design products. This is where the location really matters. Uh, oh, formatting, fail. Um, and so the last category is space, uh, or just satellite. Uh, so there's two categories of uh, uh, LPGAN, or just general satellite-based communication. There's GEO for global, uh, global Earth orbit versus LEO, or low Earth orbit. Um, global? I think so. Uh, there's really one player in satellite right now for, for GEO class and data communication, and that's Iridium. It's this 30-year-old network that they've just recently rebuilt from the ground up. Um, and that's what you're going to see first, uh, first responders and oil and gas. They'll use that as their backhaul for everything from streaming images to tiny sensor data uh, on, on um, boxes. Uh, it's accessible to, to makers. It's just really expensive. Like, they charge you per bit, I think. And you have to buy a bunch of bits up front. Um, but it's, it's totally doable. Um, but what's really exciting in the space industry is this new class of LEO, or low Earth orbits. If you're, is anybody familiar with Plant Labs and their whole model of yeah, low cost hardware, lower in orbit? Um, that's what they're doing for connectivity. Uh, and in the last year, uh, they're, they're, cube, they're called CubeSats more generally. Uh, in the last year, there's about 12 LEO startups all around the same time deploying their fleets. Uh, and they're doing test pilots um, in different parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was Swarm. Uh, they're they're a Bay Area local. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but they they they've got past that. There, it, it's kind of not to make a, an analogy uh, to the Bay Area, but it's kind of like a scooter race. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and, and uh, you know they they launched with the right uh, capabilities, but without the right credentials, um, and they've since fixed that. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it depends if it's geosynchronous or, or orbiting, I think, too, um, or sta more stationary. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's part of why there's international, regula re international uh, body around. Um, it's not just channels, but I also think the altitudes, so you don't crash into each other. Um, some of these will win, which is really exciting, because uh, they they're actually are quite affordable. They're, they start to look like lore in the sense of what data you can get, but it also looks like the cost profile. Um, so far cheaper than something like uh, Iridium. Um, yeah, so I, I, met, I met the Swarm team. They, they're, they were sorry. Um, but uh, in the next couple of years, I think it'll be... Um, even actually, Semtech announced a, a radio class of LoRa 
for LoRaWAN from space. So it's even merging the two, the two domains. Um, all right, I mean, that's all I have. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, I hope I answered some of your modem questions, and I'm ready for more. Yes? Yeah, um, there's a lot of proponents, uh, myself being uh, one of them, that on the software side, the bridge is IP. Um, because if every system speaks a standardized protocol, then you can use tools that, that are really familiar, like you can ping a satellite, uh, or you can nmap your network. Um, and that allows the hardware vendors and the, and the SDK team just to, to keep that interface pretty consistent. Um, it's, been, it's been proven harder for, for myriad reasons, but yeah. Uh, interoperability is, is a, especially on the system integrator perspective, is actually pretty achievable these days. All right, I have, yeah, questions, please. You mentioned the uh, 5G uh, SSD. Uh, no, uh, so for Wi Fi? Yeah, yeah it's, the, it's in their CC3000 series. It's, uh, I get popped into my newsfeed this morning. Um, <coughs> Oh, really? Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, um, yeah, it's, yeah. There's, there's, there's certain benefits to Cypress and Broadcom, especially because they have a lot of maturity. Um, it's well tested. Um, some of their Hardware design is questionable, as you mentioned. Um, software support um, is, is kind of hit or miss. Uh, yeah. There was another hand. Oh, there you go. So, um, so the question was, any recommendations for cellular modem, cellular transceiver? Uh, for the most part, they're all transceivers. Um, the Qualcomm part actually has an A7 processor in it, but you can't touch it. Um, so they provide you a spy interface uh, that you talk to using some protocol they invented, a wire protocol, which is pretty straightforward and kind of well documented. Um, so it depends on where you're in the world. Uh, assuming you're here in San Francisco, um, you can get a Cat M1 radio. Uh, there's off-the-shelf vendors. I think you guys have a cellular. Yeah, so. Yep. So that's the, that's the key. The reason why it's, it's super interesting is the 2G fallback. So um, the QuickTel 95 and 96, as well as the U Blocks R410, lucky, okay, uh, has the same Qualcomm modem in it. But the newest version, which is just coming out, and it looks like you have a sample of it, um, has that 2G fallback. So if you're in a part of the US that doesn't have CAT M1, you're hosed. Uh, and there's no NB-IoT. So that 2G fallback makes it really useful. Um, and it's a lower, lower cost part. Um, so if you can find a dev kit, um, there's a couple of those, um, that's a good place to start. Uh, or up teen U-Block's older three, 2G, 3G modems um, that are available. Um, if you want to do a chip up design or module up design, yeah, those are a great place to start. Ublocks is really easy to integrate. QuickTel is actually pretty uh, um, easy as well, but uh, you, you need a relationship with them. Uh, and the Nor Nordic one is not out yet uh, in mass production. Or they'll break flow control because. Yep, yep. Yeah, and um, we actually particle does that effectively on the on the boron. <coughs> uh, 
because th that, that goes back to my earlier comment around IP. Because you're speaking IP between it over a you know, UART, um, you can use things like ping or you know, just netcat and other things, which is, which is pretty nice. Cool. There's a hand over there. Oh, yeah. For generally, yes. So, so you're basically talking about an ASIC tracking problem. So you, you need to know where it is in the world, and you need to send that somewhere. Um, power is, is your first question. Uh, can you tap into, for example, the card that it's on? Uh, then power becomes less of an issue, um, generally. Uh, and where it's placed is also another uh, challenge. Like if it's on a school bus and you put it at the bottom of the school bus, you're not going to get any signal whatsoever. Um, if you have a thing, but if it has a huge antenna on the back of it because it has some ham thing, you might be able to tap into that. Um, but in general, most of the asset tracking solutions you see out there are going to be cellular with a GPS module hanging off of it. That's why the, the, the QuickTel part, um, the 95, 96, actually has GPS built in. So now you get your GPS for asset tracking, for, for tracking in the world, and you have that, uh, that modem in there to, to signal back. Um, you can totally do lower power or cellular, and that's the frequency you transmit and which of the protocols you, you adopt. Um, but uh, it'll also depend if, if, you're, if you're just streaming that, that location data once a day or once a minute. Um, but generally, the coverage is going to be with cellular. Thank you. Cool. Well, thank you again. I'm ready. All right. Yeah, let, let's wait for the people in the back grabbing another beer. I will do the same after the talk, <laughs> definitely. And I would like to say thank you to 
the whole supply frame team for organizing this, especially Jasmine and Brian in the back. <laughs> because I know it's always a bit hard to organize something like this. Um, done this before. Really appreciate it. Um, so this talk is more beginner friendly. I hope I do not uh, disappoint you in any way. Um, what is this about? I noticed there are a lot of talks on how to actually do the engineering for your prototypes. I've seen a lot of talks uh, which explain how to assemble your electronic prototype, but I don't see any talks on how do I actually organize all the stuff for my prototype. This is something which is really important because uh, you somehow have to get all the PCBs, the parts, stencil, whatever you require, um, and this is often not covered at all. Um, so let's dive in. My name is Patrick. Um, if you would, would like to follow me, go over to my Twitter account. If you would like to have pictures of me in front of a mirror, go over to the Instagram account. Um, enough about me. Um, let me give you a short disclaimer on what this is about. So we at Eisler built about 211,000 prototypes until now, and I would like to give you a rough um, collection of what went wrong, what went right, and what are our takes on electronic prototype is. Um, so you may ask yourself, why do I actually have to build a prototype? I've seen some companies which say, hey, this is just not necessary. We go straight to production and do a small batch run, and that's it. Uh -huh. um, yeah? Think so? Um, in my opinion, the only way this is possible if you are a large corporation and you have like building blocks. And when you have validated building blocks, which you just assemble to some electronic prototype, that might work out. But for us as hobbyist electronics, I think um, a prototype always has to be made. And in my opinion, it even saves time in the end if you have um, a proper way to build the prototype. And my profession is more a software engineer. I'm not an electrical engineer. And what I noticed is when it comes to electronics, it's not just about the functionality, you have much more. It's like the case around the electronic, it has to um, be validated how does the user interact with the stuff we do, and this is all necessary. Um, so I'm passionate about electronic prototyping because I think if you have a proper process to build your prototypes, it will be better for the users, it will be better for your development, and in the end, it probably will be a better product. Um, because when it comes to electronics, it's not just compiling and running all over again in 10 seconds, cycle, cycle, cycles. Um, so specific for this talk, I'm talking about stuff like um, one-off prototypes. Stuff you make to just check out something. Um, so if we are talking about the next iPhone here, this is th the tips I give probably do not cover this. Because I think we much more have stuff like, okay, I want to check out the new Wi-Fi module, I will do a breakout board for this, and then throw it away. But this is prototyping too, isn't it? Um, so I would like to go shopping with you. What I will cover is first the PCB, because we need some PCB where all the stuff get mounted on. Second, I will cover a stencil, because I think you using a stencil with a reflow is the only proper way to solder right now. I do not want to use a hand soldering iron anymore. Um, and after the stencil, I will cover the parts which I think, in my opinion, is the most complicated thing to do right. All right, let's start off with the printed circuit board. 
By the way, did you notice how the style changes during the presentation? Now it's about the board. <laughs> our design team, and I'm still proud of them, on them. But I like the stand-up comedian style. Okay, I will stay here. Um, so when it comes to the printed circuit board, there are a lot of considerations to make. So we have different quantities. We maybe want to start off with just one, two, three pieces and end up with a thousand, maybe. Uh, we have different specifications. Sometimes we have easy to make PCBs, sometimes really complicated because we have some kind of BGA ships on them. Um, then we have different technologies, speaking as in flexible PCBs, high copper PCBs, whatever, and especially important for prototyping delivery times, which really vary a lot. Um, so what people usually ask is, okay, um, PCBs usually come from China. Yeah, that's fine. Um, but please take into account that shipping takes some time from China. You can speed it up, but this has a price. Um, I had a comparison on the price down here, but I removed it because I do not want to argue on the price. You have to make sure to take the right piece. Um, I always say, okay, if it's a large quantity, I go over to China because they are really good in this. If it's just a prototype, I will probably stay at a domestic manufacturer. That's my take on this. You might have another opinion. I usually go this way. Uh, I cover this later. <laughs> um, you, you could probably also exchange Germany with the US here. So it doesn't really matter. It's my first time doing this talk in the US. So please excuse this. Um, what a lot of people don't know, and I think this is really important when it comes to the production of PCBs, is PCB product production is a chemical process. So you always have to produce a bit more than what you require. So whenever you need 10 pieces, the factory does some estimation on how high the risk is to produce this PCB, and based on this um, calculation, have a factor. So if you need 10, and it's really complicated to manufacture, the fab will probably manufacture 20 pieces to make sure you get the right amount of working PCBs. Um, if the factory does not do this, um, you might get faulty PCBs. So better ask for electrical test. Whenever an electrical test is done, the factory gives you the insurance that the PCBs work. Um, and this is something where it really is beneficial to talk to the factory to ask them, hey, how complicated is my PCB actually to manufacture? Could you give me any hints on what to do better? because usually you only have minor modifications to the PCB to improve the production yield <coughs> significantly. Um, something on the uh, design rule thingy. When it comes to the design rules, you enter in KiCad or Eagle or whatever you use. Um, if the design rule check passes, then the PCB w might work, but it, it, there is no guarantee that it works. The other way around, if the design rule check does not pass, it definitely won't work. Um, one thing which is really important whenever it comes to PCBs, copper distribution. So we have parts on the PCB which have copper on them and a few parts have no copper. Keep this level equal. This is so important, I can't stress this enough, really. Um, another thing which is often done wrong, Gerber files. Uh, who of you have dealt with Gerber files before? All right. This is an interesting thing because everyone uses them, but a lot of times it just goes wrong because the file format is a standard. 
but in the end, you need seven, at least seven of these files. And these files have a specific naming scheme. And this naming scheme is different for every application. So either you get it right or you get something wrong delivered. Um, some PCB factories have employees who do the same thing the all day long to check, OK, what layer has which name and assign the right layer assignment, which is a really strange thing. Um, so please, if you would like to make it really simple for the factory, just send them in your source files, um, because this is always much better as these Gerber files. Because then they can just choose which um, Gerber files you require, and they can select the, uh, the right export settings. Um, so this talk is on YouTube, so can, you can watch it afterwards. But if you would take a picture of one slide, take a picture of this one. If you do not know which PCB specification for some random prototype you need, and actually you don't care, you just want some PCB, go with the FR4 base material, which is the standard base material you get over and over. Um, go with the Enic finish, which is golden style finish, which is much better to solder than the Hazel. Um, go with the TG130 material, which kinder, uh, not scientific um, explain explanation now, the, the, the quality of the material. Um, some Chinese factories still have TG110, which is really bad, so the copper will probably rip off during soldering. Uh, always go higher than 130. And for most of the stuff, just stick to the classic green solder mask, because classic green, you're shaking your head because you don't like green. <laughs> but the, the, good, the good thing about green solder mask is every factory is able to produce green solder mask. That's a good thing about it. Um, this is <laughs> what it is. So the benefit of green is, uh, besides it's looking great, um, that with the, it's, it's the most developed solder mask exactly because the industry standard, and you are able to see the traces. Uh, if you look at them properly. This is really important when it comes to prototyping. We want to check, okay, where does this trace go? Um, this is a note which I see really, really regularly where people put like letters on their drawings, like explaining, hey, could you please cut out this? Could you modify this? Everything. So they put it right next to the PCB and write down all kind of notes, like, please take my child to the kindergarten this morning. I've seen everything. Please don't do this. Sometimes I see people putting this on the board at line, which is only for milling. So I've seen us try to mill out some description. <laughs> this happens. And with every proper automated factory, there is no one reading these notes. Please, don't do this. All right, <laughs> enough, enough on the uh, PCB. Um, let's take a look at the stencil. Um, I really like stencils because when you use these for soldering, besides that you are able to mount really small parts, it just looks really professional because you don't have the flux all over the PCB. And uh, it, if you do a prototype with a stencil, it looks like, okay, it's done professional. Um, and there is always a thing about, oh, I need a reflow oven. Essentially, everything works. From the heat gun over to a pan, it doesn't really matter as long as you don't use it for doing the pancakes any, uh, afterwards. So it's really not that critical when it comes to prototyping. Question in the back? Just don't fry the parts, but these ovens don't get so hot, so this works most of the time. Um, I would skip this one because 
uh, every EDA tool nowadays supports the paste layer. Um, something which people ask me is, how should I modify the cutout in the stencil compared to the SMD pad? Um, please don't modify it all, because usually the stencil factory takes over, like shrinking the pads a bit. And most of the time, this works out pretty well. Um, for us, at Islaw Stencil starts at six US dollars, so I would give it a try. Um, next up, parts. For me, this is the most complicated part because it's so difficult to organize all this stuff. Um, first of all, you need a bill of materials, and please don't mix up the bill of materials with the pick and place list. So bill of materials is what is your shopping list. Pick and place list is where to actually put the parts. So that might be nothing new for you, but I've seen it all. Um, so the bill of materials should look kind of like this. Designators or name, whatever you call it, like R1, R2, uh, put the value in, give it a footprint. The footprint is really helpful to the um, assembly factory to identify which part is this um, and how it may it be rotated. Uh, put a manufacturer in because the manufacturer part number might be ambiguous, so um, especially if it's just a number. Um, so always put the manufacturer on this too. Um, and this is something really important. Um, when it comes to resistors and capacitors, which don't serve a really specialized function within your circuit, don't put the MPN on the bill of materials. Why? Especially for capacitors, there's a huge churn in the capacitors you are able to source. If you put in the MPN for a capacitor, the case might be, no, it not might be, in, it, it will definitely not be sourceable after a few weeks. So it's much better when it comes to resistors and capacitors to not put the MPN in, but just give a rough description. Like uh, for a resistor, this is 100K0603. You can drill this down a bit more, like it should be 0.1%, but only gives the MPN in a really, really rare case where you exactly need this resistor or capacitor. This gives the assembly factory the freedom to decide for whatever resistor and capacitor you want, and they have. This really prevents a lot of mail ping pong back and forth. So give them a specification, a list of parameters, and keep it as short as possible. If it's just some pull up or pull down, just say, give me everything you have, which is 100K. Um, so when it comes to prototype assembly, we're not talking about pick and place here, always go with the cut tape. So there are usually three types of packaging available for, let's say in this case, DigiKey. Um, avoid the DigiRear, which has a MOQ of one, but they charge five bucks for the re-reeling. So when you sc scroll through your shopping cart in DigiKey and notice, whoa, there is a capacitor uh, which costs six US dollars for two pieces, you selected the DigiReel, which is not necessary for hand assembly. Um, the other case might not happen where you accidentally select the 2,000 uh, 2, pieces. Um, always go with the cut tape. Did you keep pro tip up next um, to check if your shopping cart only contains cut tape? See, SKUs at DigiKey always end with one ND and or, or CTND, then it's a cut tape. Question in the back. Question, the question is, um, I prefer to order 
everything together. Because um, it, it might work for some resistors you use quite often, but if it's something which you might have at stock somewhere below your desk, close to the trash bin, probably, um, you won't do that. I, I rather spend the few bucks on having de definitely getting the part than to search somewhere uh, on my desk. Um, but that's totally up to you. Um, and I like to have a complete shopping list of the project I do to just make sure I have everything in place. Um, so for the quantity, what I do, I always round up to 10 all the time um, because most of the time it doesn't really matter, especially if it's just chicken food. Um, if you say the, I call them the, the first class uh, distributors, if these are too expensive for you, no problem, just order in China, but please make sure that you get the parts also at these, at least one of these distributors, because there might be people, especially when it comes to open source hardware, which might want to um, build your project, um, then you should give them the opportunity or the, the freedom to order at these distributors. So if you decide, okay, just source it from China, it's fine, but please make sure that it's not only sourceable from China. Um, something I really like to do is to put designators on the back. This is something which, for example, DigiKey allows during the ordering process. Um, they give you the opportunity to put some kind of designator name, whatever you prefer, on the back. This is really handy because you get the package from DigiKey, you unwrap it, put it on your desk, and then you see, okay, this bag is my U1. Then you directly know where to put it. Sometimes, especially for small projects, it's possible to assemble it completely without um, having the drawing on the screen. Okay, um, this was the main part of the talk. And now I have a really special um, announcement. Um, I would like to give a short introduction what Eisler actually is doing. So I explained to you how to source a PCB, a stencil, and parts. If you want to completely outsource this part, um, then you can come over to us because we deliver you all these three parts within one box delivered to your doorstep. So you have the project with us and um, you can order this project as often as you like and you get it ready to assemble as a kit. Um, until now, the service to the United States was really bad. I actually have no clue why people order with us from the United States, but <laughs> because of the shipping time, obviously. But starting the 4th of May, this will change because um, we officially start to manufacture domestically in the US. So whenever you need your prototype delivered, uh, come to us, it will be definitely with you in seven business days domestically manufactured. Um, so yeah, that's what, that was everything on my talk. Here's a, sli a quote from Thomas Edison. Um, so I'm happy to answer your questions. I got a second of silence, sorry. <laughs> um, assignments? Um, no, we don't. Are you guys a fab house or are you outsourcing? We outsource. So you're just kidding them? We are kidding them and what is important, we only outsource to uh, local manufacturers. So whenever you order in Europe or in the US, you always get it domestically manufactured, which I think is really important to get it quick. Next question up there. We definitely do not want to restrict you on the part selection. That's 
uh, or because of this, we partnered with Funnel DigiKey. So everything you get at these distributors, you get with us. And if you don't get the parts with these distributors, well, you might to reconsider if you really want to use this part. Right. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? If not, I would prefer uh, to get a beer. Okay. One. Uh, if you approach me after the talk, we may can talk about assembly too. But I think um, a properly validated prototype, as in assembled on your own, is beneficial to a later assembly which runs flawlessly. We can do. It's it's uh, beta. <laughs> All right, oh, one far in the back. <laughs> test tricks. We don't test do testing at all. That's up to you. Short question, short answer. <laughs> I want to head over to the beer. <laughs> All right. I guess that's it, Brian. Come on. <laughs>